In this lecture, we're going to cover attacks on Entro. So we've already seen how Entro works and how to see it as a lattice space system or how to, well, turn it into lattice space system so that we can use lattice algorithms to attack it. So you can run LOL on it or you can run enumeration on it. But there are also attacks that come from, well, the way that it encodes this hard lattice problem into something where you can actually do decryption. And the first of those that we're going to look at is the evaluation at one attack. All right, what does it mean? So remember that we're dealing with polynomials here. So H was the public key, M was the message. The public key is some polynomial which has coefficients modulo Q, which is a large number. M has coefficients zero and plus minus one. Um, all polynomials have degree up to N minus one. And R is another polynomial which has well, a fixed number of plus one, one minus one, uh, one coefficients, and all the other coefficients are zero. Now, because R has these fixed number of coefficients equal to one and to minus one, and well, these numbers are the same, if you compute R of one, well, all the powers of x turn into ones, and so you're just getting the coefficients in front of it, so we're getting plus t minus t, which gives zero. So if we compute r of 1, we're getting 0. And then similarly, um, the definition of g also had the same condition. So t coefficients equal to 1, t coefficients equal to minus 1. And so also h, the public key evaluated at 1, gives you 0. OK, so if we now look at the ciphertext and evaluate this at 1, then it starts with r times h. Well, both of those are 0 at 1. So they go away and we see that the ciphertext and the message have the same value at 1. So just taking the ciphertext computed at 1, we learn what the message evaluated at 1 is. Now, typically, you have as many 1s as zeros. That's the average ciphertext. And so there are many, many messages which have that. So the message will have as many zeros, as many plus 1s as minus 1s. And so m of 1 is somewhere close to 0. But sometimes m of 1 is large. So there are many more plus 1s or there are many more minus 1s. So the absolute value of this can be quite different. And on the ciphertext, that's actually polynomial mod q. So it's, it's, it's really puzzling that something which is a small polynomial, namely that m, you can see the value by computing the value at c. And well, all this is mod q. So well, you might see a reduction mod Q come in if Q is much smaller than M. OK, now Entro rejects extreme messages. But that means you wouldn't get the all one message or the all minus one messages. And OK, nowadays we're typically using Entro as a, as a cam anyway, so it's sending a random message. But when it was suggested as an encryption system, they dealt with this by having some randomization function with M so that you wouldn't lose like messages. There wouldn't be a censorship on what messages you could send, but it was all handled by the padding or by this randomization. Now, if you think, OK, well, this only comes because R and H have these very special properties. For instance, this F of 1 is not 0. Well, else you would have a division by 0, so that would be really bad. So for instance, we could choose R the same whether we picked, uh, picked F, namely to have only t minus 1 minus 1s and t ones. Well, then we still know what r of 1 is, and h is public anyway. So we would again get the evaluation at 1 to inform us about what m is, even if there is some contribution from the first part. Well, we could just remove that part. So that doesn't help. What would help is to change the um, ring to be modeled of the cyclotomic polynomial phi of n rather than modulo x to n minus 1. So here I'm assuming that n is a prime, which is a typical case for n show. And so the only factor that exists is the x minus 1. OK, so that's the evaluation in one attack, which is really um, nothing that has to do with lattices. It's something that just comes from the way that these polynomials um, encode their hard problem. Now, mathematical attacks, this is more like a crypto attack. Mathematical attacks are something we're going to see next is a meet in the middle attack. There's lattice basis reduction, which we have seen already. And what we see in this talk is a hybrid attack, which is combining something, which is the brute force search with a lattice attack. And then on the crypto attack side, well, 
you can have chosen cipher text tags, you can have decryption failures, so that's similar to the reaction text that we have seen with sloppy Alice for code based crypto, and we have seen for isogeny based cryptography as well that by the way that the other party reacts to a message, the attacker can well figure out what the key or at least what the cipher text is. And then padding schemes or what we just see with the evaluation at one attack are also in the category of crypto attacks. Now oh, let's go ahead this idea of doing win and meet in the middle attack. So that's something very typical for um, cryptography or in general algorithms design. If you have a large search, you're trying to do well an exponential search on some variable, you could try to do a divide and conquer approach. So split this up into two about equally sized parts and then search those two parts if you can find a way to have, well, find a match. And then you pre-compute this side and then you try to match this one up. If you have seen the baby step giant step attack as an attack on discrete logs in normal cryptography, say fine field Diffie-Hellman or elliptic curve cryptography, that's a classical um, divide and conquer attack, which also gives a square root speed up. We're going to see the same here. However, it's a little bit more tricky to set this one up. So let's let's think about, okay, this F is a sparse thing. So we have N positions. We know that only T of them are plus one, T of them are minus one. So we could just split them in, well, the top N part, um, N over two coefficients, the bottom N over two coefficients, and then we search here and we search here. Or I search the plus ones, you search the minus ones, and then we shall meet. And we do know that the public key H is, well, F divided by, uh, sorry, 3G divided by F. And, well, F is not the part that we split up. And so we can turn this into something where we have most of the information public. So we have F1 times H, and we have minus F2 times H. And if there was no contribution from this G, we would just do a collision search on these two parts. But there is a G. But we do know that g is, is very small. We know that g has just coefficients plus and minus 1 and 0. And so 3g has coefficients plus and minus 3 and 0. So, well, we can't really do all searches and then search with 3, but we know that this is a small number in comparison to q. And so the, the idea is that this small number is unlikely to change the sign from positive to negative or vice versa. So if a coefficient in f1 times h is positive, it should also be positive in minus f2 times h. And so what this function c is doing here, it takes this polynomial and outputs for each of the n coefficients, well, 0 or 1, depending on this indicator function. So the indicator is on, well, is this coefficient larger than 0 or yes or no? And so then we're trying to match values where this indicator for this C and this C gives the same value. And for those, we do try whether when we take H times the sum of one F2, then we're getting something which could be a 3G. So then we're looking whether this has, well, just zero plus three and minus three as coefficients. And so if you split F1 and F2 in equal sizes, then each of those, instead of having to run well, a full search, they have a square root of the search. But also, we do need to compute, say, the left side here, we compute this, we compute C of this for every, every choice of F1, and then we compute the right side for every choice of F2, we compute the C of this, and we see whether we have a match on the indicator functions. If you don't have that much storage, Christine van Friedendahl has written an algorithm where she has a trade-off on this meet in the middle attack um, where if you decrease the memory you have to increase the running time. Now how big are our searches anyway? So how long do we have to wait? One nice thing to observe is that we don't have just one target, it's not just one F that is good, but actually N Fs that are good. Remember that H was the fraction of 3g divided by h uh, by f. And so if we multiply f by g and f both by x to the i, well, it cancels in here. 
Now, x times f is just the rotation because, well, we're computing mod x to the n minus 1. So that means it has the same coefficients. We're just taking it and rotating it i positions and, well, flipping about at the end because we're reducing mod x to the n minus 1. So we can find f, but we can also find x to the i times f. And no matter which one we find, each of them gives us the same ability to decrypt an entry. So each of these targets is a valid target. All right, so what are our normal choices? Well, we have n positions. We're trying t out of those for the plus ones. That leaves us with n minus t choices, which we try for the t minus 1 minus 1. So that if n minus t choose t minus 1. And then we have n good solutions. So the number of rotations is, well, the length of this vector, of the coefficient vector, and that's n. And so both the running time and the memory of this mean in the middle attack against the entry rule um, is this value L there. So the square root of the search space divided by the square root of the number of good solutions. And as I said on the previous slide, you can reduce the memory. I mentioned um, lattice attacks already, so here's again the matrix that we're using, and it's again showing how you can actually get the short vector g and f from this lattice. In this lattice, we can compute, so this h was the multiplication by the public key expressed as a matrix. So the key pair that we want to find, this g and f, is a short vector in this lattice. Now, if you're doing sieving, then it has exponential running time in the dimension of the lattice. So this 2n here, well, we have n here and in there, so the dimension is 2n, and the well work factor is 2 to the 0 0.292 times the dimension of the lattice. And then there is a little o of n, which, well, can also take quite some effort because it's in the exponent. And this memory requirement is slightly less than that. So I've shown you enumeration. I sent you to Thais uh, slides for the sieving algorithms. Um, sieving costs have gotten a bit better because, well, the faster sieving algorithms. On the other hand, the, the effect of memory um, is getting worse because, well, it's, it's much, much larger. And for enumeration, you can always reduce your memory. So we don't really know what the crossover point is. For experiments, well, you can use computer with a lot of RAM, but that doesn't mean that it scales the same way. So memory is much more an issue than time. Um, and both of these algorithms, both sieving and enumeration, you can use as subroutines at BKZ. So that's how you would be attacking Entru as purely a lattice system. But then a nice idea is uh, the hybrid attack to do Hargraf and Graham, where he's combining lattice basis reduction and Odlitzko's mean in the middle attack that we've just seen. So you want to take this uh, this entry lattice and, well, okay, you probably do some pre-processing, you use LAL already, and then you just take a small part of this matrix. So here we will be having the full basis, sorry, the full lattice, and we now write it in a slightly different way. So we're having some, well, W here, well, fits there, and then this h here is a big n times n matrix. And we're doing just the sub matrix of this and call this, well, b. And this is after doing some uh, operations. So that's where the exogenous modular matrix comes in. And so here we're doing bkz with the best we can do with, say, sieving or enumeration in the middle. So we're doing a lattice basis reduction on a smaller dimension matrix here. There will be some parts, some matrices here. And then for the last part, we do a search. So that's where the kind of brute force searching comes in. And so we're doing a guess of what these values could be. And then, well, see whether it works. And if this lattice in the middle was good enough, and called a measure of quality for lattices is the fermite factor. I didn't talk about this one, but it's something well, when you do your BKZ, you can get an estimate of what the Hermite factor is. Then um, you can, in this part, do a similar collision search 
as we have just seen with Odlitska. So in the, in the hybrid attack, you're actually getting the best of both worlds. You're having some saving part and you're having some search part. This can shave off a few bits, so this is still kind of where, where research is happening. So in the uh, NIST competition, there are mostly considerations just with sieving or with enumerations, but also hybrid attacks estimates are done and there might be a few bits different from the main thing.